Welcome back to the Movie Bible Podcast. This week, you've got myself, Colin. I'm joined by Nick and Brennan as we talk about the opening weekend for 1917, Like a Boss, Just Mercy, and Underwater. Remember, as always, you can check us out online at moviebiblereviews.com. All right, so breaking down this weekend's top five at the box office, we've got 1917 in first place with... 36 million, 36 and a half million dollars domestically, followed by The Rise of Skywalker with a little bit over 15 million dollars domestic, Jumanji the next level in the number three spot at 14 million dollars domestic, followed by Like a Boss opening at 10 million dollars domestic, and followed by Just Mercy expanding also at 10 million dollars domestically. Uh, So 1917 won by quite a bit. I don't think that was really going to be a surprise. Um, the hype for this movie, especially within the past few weeks since it had the uh, one day showings on Christmas Day, have given it really good audience reactions. Um, so there's been really strong word of mouth and they advertised the hell out of this thing. So there was really no question of whether or not it would lead the box office. And it's sitting at about $60 million worldwide, which is a pretty solid start. Uh, but this movie is going to be really similar to Ford v Ferrari, just in the fact that it has to earn a lot to really be profitable. So this is sitting at about a $90 million budget, uh, pretty similar to Ford v Ferrari. And when you count marketing on top of that, it's probably sitting around a $200 million budget worldwide uh, somewhere in that vicinity. So it does have quite a bit of work to go, but I think the legs on 1917 will be pretty solid to help it get to that number. Yeah. 1917 is like, the, is the latest in a long run of movies where, of Oscar movies that release like right, like in a couple theaters on Christmas and they go really wide in January. Uh, and then that's kind of where the, the legs that you mentioned kind of come into the picture. So American Sniper was the huge one when that came out. I think that was 2014 or 15, but it just made so much money domestically because it had no competition in January. Um, I think The Revenant was a big one too when that came out. And it's all these movies that. Um, started to figure really prominently in the awards races. And I know 1917, like just really did really nicely at the golden globes, won best, best drama and all the other, all, all these other awards too. So um, the buzz has been building for a really long time for this one. Um, yeah. And then we have like, we have like Doolittle coming out next week and like bad boys three. So like, there's really no competition for this movie for a while. Um, and we're the Oscar nominations are going to come out soon or tomorrow at least or today, I guess, when you're listening to this podcast, everybody. But, um, yeah, it's going to get a ton of awards, award nominations there, a ton, ton of technical stuff, probably Best Picture stuff as well. So, yeah, this is definitely the beginning of something big, because I think this movie is really going to have some great great week-to-week drops. It definitely lends itself to that. Yeah, this is the perfect time to have this film come out and kind of expand wide. As you said, it's at about $60 million globally. Um, it, it's opening up in the majority of the European markets over the next few weeks. But the big thing with the film and the reason it's making so much money, I think is purely that uh, Golden Globe uh, win. I mean, just kind of the average folk is going to see the headlines saying 1917 best picture winner at the Globes. And I think from that, literally a week later, it opens wide. I think that's great word of mouth. That's great marketing. Um, and, And that's kind of the reason they opened up to $36.5 million domestically. And we're going to see this film do really well over the next few weeks. Yeah, and so that's why this is a little bit different than Ford v. Ferrari is with Ford v. Ferrari, you had literally all the Oscar-worthy movies opening up um, within a month of that's release, whereas kind of like you guys said, with 1917, there's nothing that's really going to compete here for the next month and a half or so. Um, So 1917 definitely has some pretty strong legs underneath it, um, and it's got honestly really incredible reaction so far so it's got an a minus cinema score uh, which is really solid means audiences are leaving happy for the most part critics have been leaving pretty happy and it is really banking a lot on that one shot style of shooting it uh, which for most people uh, just the casual movie goer doesn't remember birdman and so this is kind of the first time they're seeing that um, which is just going to be a huge draw for it as well yeah, and I think I'm one of the few people that just doesn't like this movie. Uh, we talked about this um, last week, and we kind of mentioned this in other pods. Um, I'm not a huge fan of this movie, um, and that one shot thing is undeniably impressive. And I think this movie is going to clean up at like the the technical awards, the Oscars. It's just it's going to just 
just bank in like cinematography, sound editing, sound mixing, like all these editing, all these words below the line stuff. Uh, but I, I don't really know if this amounts to anything. And I had a similar issue with Dunkirk as well, where I'm like, yeah, I, really cool. I see what you're doing with all this technical stuff and you're playing with time, but what is that really amounting to? Um, and the same thing with 1917, like I don't really have a good answer to that. Um, so it's tough for me because I definitely see a lot of the greatness in it, but um, I can't, I just can't fall in love with it. And I don't really see what the point of any of this is, but I don't know. It seems to be striking a chord with a ton of other people. Um, you know what? I, I, I did really enjoy this film. Um, I, I feel kind of exactly the same as same way as you Nick with kind of Dunkirk the similarities and how um, I found myself enjoying this film now I didn't dislike it as much as you did I really did like it but I didn't fall in love with it per se like I just really admire um, the technical elements of this film I really enjoyed that kind of one take perspective I thought it was a great immersive way to get get you into the film and I, I did have a good time with it and I definitely agree it's going to do very well kind of in the below the line categories um, but yeah, it, it, it's not one of my favorite films of 2019, um, but it, I definitely had a really good time watching it. And I think that it is an absolute theater experience. And if you're going to see this film, that's definitely the way to see it. Yeah, I agree pretty much exactly with what you said about it, Brennan. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's the best movie ever made, but I think technically, um, it just blows pretty much everything else we saw within the past year out of the water, um, just because of how hard it is to do one shot. And just with, especially with all the exteriors and everything they did on the outside sets and on the battlefield, um, they've even started releasing some behind the scenes videos and just all the work put into to getting this on film is just incredible. But I kind of agree with Nick. I, I didn't really come away with anything other than that awe at seeing it on the big screen. I think for as long as we spend with the two main characters in this movie, they could be a bit more realized. Um, you know, one of them in particular, you get kind of a reveal literally within the last uh, few frames in the movie that I think if it had been delivered a lot earlier, could have had more emotional weight and, and really made that character a little something more. But I, I think technically this movie is amazing as far as characters and story. It, it could use some work. One thing I yeah. do hope, though, uh, sorry, Nick, to cut you off there. But one thing I do hope is that. Obviously, the cinematography is is kind of the main focus, and Roger Deakins did a great job with this film, and and that's definitely deserved. Um, but I, I really want this film to do well, um, kind of in terms of editing, because I think the way this film is put together, obviously, it really does look like one take, and I think that uh, goes goes kind of towards the editing big time, and I think that this film definitely needs to be recognized for that. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree there. I know it, one of the few frustrating thing is I feel like with these war movies, I think they're so concerned on making it cinematic and all these doing all these crazy bells and whistles. And I think that's all we've become focused on um, as the viewer, um, which is frustrating. So I think there's definitely, there's been so many great war movies over the years. And I think there's definitely something to something new to capture about all these tales. Um, but like, I know me though, maybe the entire time is I'm, just, I'm looking for where like the fake cut, the cuts are when they, when they take the camera behind, like, like little like dirt piles and things like that. It's like, oh, that was probably a cut or something like that. And um, I think we get, I think it's one of the things that I, I don't really feel like, I think all the love for this movie, I think it's going to be really fleeting. We're going to all love it in a second because we say like, wow, how did they do all of this? But then we'll kind of step back and similar to movies like The Revenant and Birdman and like Life of Pi, like all these really like impeccable, like technical, like marvels that we they all like we're all like oh my gosh how did they do that and we kind of step back a few years later uh, and then it's like well do any of us talk about this movie anymore it's like no not really um so i think that's kind of what 1917's ultimate um kind of um it's kind of what we're going to look for with this movie in a few years like i just don't like we're going to be we're going to look back in like 2023 and like oh yeah i remember when 1917 that was that was something huh <laughs> like and we'll come we'll kind of return to some other many movies that kind of touch on something more interesting um i don't know I, that, that's just my take i i think this movie's fine um i i think anything else anything more than that is a little much in my perspective uh, a lot of cool camera tricks that don't really do much i think that's why films particularly uh, war films like the hurt locker i think that's why that a film like that would stand the test of time kind of in comparison yeah absolutely there's a lot of great stuff out there and um yeah the hurt locker is a good one because it really kind of gets into the psychology of war and what war does to someone. And I think 
there's a lot of good things there. And I, I mean, this this movie is set out to do something different. Like like Colin said, like the characters aren't really like the focus of it, and and that's fine. I think there's definitely you can create a movie and a cinematic experience that isn't heavily character focused. Uh, it's definitely something that Dunkirk was trying to do as well. Um, I think the comparisons we're going to keep comparing these two movies back and forth, and so with so is everyone else. Um, but there's just I you have to do something different with maybe I I don't know I just didn't really get like maybe they were trying to tell a story through the scenery or things like that um I that that stuff was maybe lost on me because I don't really I didn't really get anything I don't know it's I'm talking myself in circles the point is 1917 eh, I, it's probably gonna win a lot of awards and but I'll, and we'll respect it um and then probably maybe, maybe forget about it soon after that yeah and I think this is one that it's a very great theater experience, but I can't imagine watching this at home and getting nearly the same feel um, just because I think a lot of that under the surface stuff isn't as strong with this movie. Yeah, absolutely. It's I, you, you see this movie in IMAX and nothing else and you get blown away. Um, and it's, it's also just incredible to think about they started filming or producing this movie in like the summer and got it done for um, the awards this year, which is just, like crazy to think about when you see this movie and all the moving parts in it. Um, but yeah, like you, you see it and you get amazed by all like the crazy set pieces. Um, and that's, that's literally the only way to see it. Yeah. So that is 1917. Um, and we'll move on to the rise of Skywalker, which was at number two at the box office this weekend uh, with 15 million and some change. I did see this again for the first time since opening weekend. And I can confirm that it still sucks. Um, <laughs> there's, there's nothing redeemable about this movie. I've, I've just settled, settled with that. I wasn't angry watching it this time as someone who's uh, always had star Wars as basically a religion, but I just didn't care. And, and that's really where I'm at with episode nine. It's really funny. Cause, uh, we both kind of shared our frustrations the weekend after we saw this movie. Um, and I haven't thought about it since. Um, that's just how, like, f- all how fleeting it is and how, like, just how none of its emotional beats are earned or anything like that. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> this movie kind of just, it just sucks. Uh, and But it's doing okay at the box office, I guess. So maybe Disney, that's a silver lining for Disney. But, um, yeah, it's definitely behind uh, last jedi and force awakens it hasn't even crossed a billion yet um i say that like it's like oh my gosh the sky's falling but yeah it's not <laughs> it's not doing as great um but yeah it's i haven't thought about this movie at all i think i almost forgot that it was in theaters for a second because i just don't care anymore it was supposed to it was projected to pass a billion um on Saturday and it, and it hadn't reached there yet. So I think that's, I mean, obviously it's going to pass a billion at some point it's making a ton of money. It's not a problem, but it definitely is a huge kind of step down from what we've been used to with, with this trilogy in particular. But for the most part, I mean, what happened with solo and all the other stuff, I mean, it's not a big surprise that they're kind of dropping off um, at the box office. And that's just more in terms of money, not talking about quality of the film with solo, but uh, I'm not too surprised. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously this is doing much better than solo, but it is pretty slow. You know, it'll probably cross a billion dollars this coming week because it's only about $11 million short, uh, but that'll take it five weeks, which is, I mean, incredibly short compared to the force awakens and even pretty short compared to the last Jedi. Um, so that's kind of where star Wars is at. Glad it's going away for a little while and, uh, we'll get back to it in a few years. <laughs> And that then so no, sad. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Nick, Colin Nick hasn't thought about there. this movie at all, but I think about this movie at least once a day, and it just <laughs> it just angers me. <laughs> um, so we'll move on to Jumanji: The Next Level, uh, which is in its fifth weekend at the box office, pulled in a pretty cool fourteen million dollars, um, and it hasn't quite had the legs of jumanji welcome to the jungle but it still had pretty solid legs sitting at about 671 million dollars worldwide uh sony is certainly not going to be upset with how this is performed yeah nothing really much new to report here it's just doing really well Uh, just another good hit for sony and along with little women it's just this is a really solid end of 2019 and in 2020 for them they're just doing really solid yeah this film's got legs and it's it's kind of showing that i mean 
good solid drops from a week to week uh, basis. It's going to make a, a little bit more money as, as it progresses. And I think it's, it's good for them. And we're going to probably see in the next few weeks, the announcement of that third film. Yep. And so with that, we'll move on to a new release, uh, which was like a boss this weekend, pulled it in an estimated $10 million. Um, I really don't have a ton to say about this movie other than this is my designated bathroom break trailer. Um, <laughs> when I first saw this trailer a few months ago, I just had an innate hatred for this movie. Um, and so whenever the trailer comes on and at the movies, I pop into the restroom and that's, that's all I have to add. I saw this movie and it was, it was awful <laughs> right for me. I had just, I, I think, I feel like we've been talking about this movie for like forever because of that, like. Paramount's just been throwing this before every single movie, and I've just been like, I think I was done with Like a Boss back in like October when I saw <laughs> when I saw the trailer for like the fifteenth time. Um, but yeah, it's I had I had no intention of seeing this movie, but I figured whatever, uh, who cares? It's 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 something. It's not. It's one of those movies where it's just a lazy comedy. There's nothing really to get super angry about. Um, it's. Like including credits, the movie's like eighty three minutes long, so it's there's like literally nothing there, and it's not like, I, like I have like bad flashbacks to, to last year with something like like What Men Want, which was like over a hundred minutes long, and it was just just so terrible to sit there. I mean, I guess this movie kind of knows like that it's not anything special, and you get, you get in, you get out, whatever. You don't really have any laughs. Um, but when I was watching it, it was just kind of a bummer just to kind of see Rose Byrne and Tiffany Haddish with less than Stephen like decent material. Um, I mean, I know <laughs> this movie is about like makeup, like two uh, makeup artists who open, have their own company. And then Salma Hayek comes in and tries to buy their company and mess with them and take it from them. Um, so maybe um, I'm not necessarily in like the, I'm not the target audience for this movie. Uh, they're definitely like all the billboards and stuff have been like, woo girls night out, like come to the movie, see like a boss, but <laughs> it's, it's just not <laughs> like, it's just not funny. Like any way you slice it, um, it's just I just kind of wanted it to end, and it was eighty three minutes long. So I, it's it's tough. Yeah, I mean I I haven't seen it. Uh, I maybe I will at some point, but um, it, it's January, right? I mean, yeah, the you, January releases. This is what you expect. It's probably better that you don't see it. Like, <laughs> like you saw the trailer, you you kind of get the gist of it. It's just a lazy comedy with um, a bunch of talented people doing improv that doesn't yeah. really work and it's kind of weirdly edited together um yeah it's just there's it's it's just not great i just kind of feel bad because i want tiffany haddish to do be in better things like she, I, we, I feel like we saw girls trip and she had such great promise and then he was in stuff like the kitchen and what was that nobody's fool the weird tyler perry movie that came yeah, out yeah um i just i kind of want better stuff for her and similar with rose burns i think they're both really talented yeah, my first reaction when I saw this trailer for the first time was, this looks like a female comedy written by men. And then at the end of the trailer, I had that suspicion confirmed. And I was like, yeah, I, I really don't want to see this. Um, and I'm, I'm still pretty adamant to that. Unfortunately, I used all of my AMC passes before I got the chance this week. So <laughs> just gonna, smart man, smart man. Just going to chalk that up as a win. <laughs> Not going to worry about this. <laughs> yeah, and it's weird because this movie costs... Um, twenty nine million dollars. Um, I feel like I've had this conversation with before with Paramount, where like a lot of their weird movies cost like way more than you would think. Um, and I, I guess they have to pay people up front because there's no way this movie like costs twenty nine million dollars. It's like it just looks so cheap, and it's just there's like three sets in the entire movie, or like four sets. There's like an office building for Salma Hayek. There's like their storefront, and then like there's two houses that they go to, and that's really it. <laughs> so it's just like where like where is this money coming from? It looks it feels like they shot it in like two days, where they were like they didn't really have a script, and they just like turned the camera on. They were like, ah, say something. We have to get to this point in the scene, but just <laughs> figure out how to get there. Like do do things. Oh great, cut. We'll go to the next scene. Like, it's kind of really all it is. And there's like a weird can. There's like weird cameos, and then the movie just kind of like ends. Like it feels like it was reshot, but like not reshot because they didn't have the funds to do it. You know, like they were like, "Oh shit, we're in a we're in a bind here." Um, oh, I know, and like they just like then the movie's over, and it's it's very bizarre. Um, but yeah, it's like I I don't know. People when I walked out of the theater, people were like, "Oh yeah, it was fine." So maybe 
this is for people other than cynical 24 year old guys i don't really know yeah potentially that might be it (laughs) yeah fortunately i don't think we're gonna talk about this one very long um really i want can i do can we do a spoiler pod on like a boss can we do a five part five part mini series on like a boss It'll probably be you doing that yourself. alone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Me talking to myself, going sl- slowly insane. <laughs> um, so we'll move on to Mercy, <laughs> which expanded this week and pulled in a pretty similar to like a boss, an estimate of around $10 million. I can't really find a budget estimate for this anywhere, but I can't imagine it's going to be that large. Um, and the reactions to this have been pretty positive. Um, they Actually has a higher cinema score than 1917, sitting at an A plus, um, which is pretty hard to get. Um, so it's it's got really good word of mouth uh, from moviegoers going to see it, and so I think it'll have pretty solid legs. And just being the kind of movie it is, it doesn't have to make a huge amount of money to make money. Yeah, I think I'm one of the f- I'm like one of the few people that doesn't really like this movie. Um, strangely enough, there, there's a trend in this episode with 1917. Um, but yeah, there's there's like a every single year there seems like right around Christmas there's a movie that kind of releases right ar- in limited theaters um, and then kind of go- goes wide next year. That's it's definitely an Oscar. That's definitely like an Oscar baby type movie. I mean, like a couple years ago we had like The Post and like last year we had On the Basis of Sex and this kind of feels like in the same mold as those where it's it's a bunch of movie stars in like a pretty standard kind of very obvious movie about important things. Um, and for me, like I, this movie is probably going to do well with crowds and obviously good cinema score. Uh, it just didn't really work for me. It's one of those courtroom dramas where um, like they have every speech that the lawyer gives is kind of like a whole, like, like they're just, they kind of go on this whole tangent about morality and doing what's right. And we seek justice and like all of these, like these little, like, things that you hear actors say in movies like this all the time. Um, it's for me, it's pretty surface level. I, I like all the people involved here. Um, direct the director, uh, Daniel, uh, Des- Destin, Daniel Cretton, I think that's his name, but he's doing a uh, Shang-Chi in a couple of years for Marvel. And I really like his work. And then you have Michael B. Jordan and Brie Larson and Jamie Foxx in here. Um, a lot of good people. It's just, it's just one of those movies where it's pretty superficial because it's trying to play to the crowd. Um, so maybe same thing, like a boss, Maybe some this movie is for other people than me. I just didn't really get much out of it. It's pretty superficial. Yeah, I mean, I think that this film definitely is is a solid crowd pleaser, and you see that with the A plus cinema score. And I don't know how it's going to perform awards wise, but it definitely has a little bit of potential. I know that Jamie Fox picked up a supporting actor nomination from the Screen Actors Guild, um, but I, I I haven't heard too much buzz for it uh, besides that. Um, but this is a little bit of a later kind of wide release considering. Uh, the the Oscar voting closed not too long ago, and the nominations will be released tomorrow. Um, but I think that we'll probably see this film money wise do well and probably have decent legs as the weeks go on. Yeah, it feels like it definitely hamstrung itself a little bit going against 1917 as like these Oscar movies that release wide in January because it feels like there's always a few that try to do this, but there's only one that really ever truly pops. And it looks like 1917 is that kind of movie. Um, but yeah, I'm sure, I mean, this movie didn't really work for me, but it's it's hard to get mad about it, you know, because it's, uh, it's kind of, it documents the work of lawyer Brian Stevenson, who founded the Equal Justice Initiative, which has gone on to save, I think, 125 people that were wrongfully uh, convicted and put on death row. So just has some really good ideas in it. And it's about a really good, like, true, true to life story. But it's... It's it's the most Oscar-y, like, oh, let's put the camera here. It's time for Jamie Foxx's Oscar moment type of thing. Um, that's kind of the whole movie. So um, I think if you see the trailer, the trailer is actually pretty, like, true to what the movie is. So if the trailer isn't interesting to you, then you probably really like this movie. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go see it this weekend, uh, actually during the week. And, I mean, it's, it's January. The quality of movies isn't going to be very high. So I'm hoping this will be kind of a bright spot in it overall. Um, And so with that, that rounds out the top five, but we will touch on another uh, new release this weekend, which was Underwater, which is the movie about the people underwater, um, in case you weren't (laughs) sure on that. 
Um, and it pulled in a little over $7 million uh, domestically, estimating about $14 million worldwide, but it has up to an estimated $80 million budget. So this movie is sinking fast. Uh, you're welcome for the pun. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is kind of a shame because I really enjoyed this movie. Um, I, I think this movie uh, is the number one movie I've seen so far this year. Uh, but it's the only 2020 I release 2020 release I've seen, so it doesn't have much competition. <laughs> um, but I really enjoyed it. I think it really gives you what you're there for. It reminded me a lot of Crawl that we got last July, where you this this movie is very aware of why you would want to watch this movie with people being attacked by mermaid squids underwater, and that's pretty much all it delivers on. Um, it does have a little bit of rough edges towards the third act especially uh, but i think overall this movie works it's pretty short you're in and out and you get carnage and that's pretty much it yeah i think more movies need to take place underwater i think it's just a good setting for a movie and there's a lot of tension in there um yeah this movie i don't i don't know if this movie's good but i really loved watching it <laughs> it was really entertaining because it's you can send this movie was filmed back in like 2017 and now it's just coming out so it's like a typical january thing where there was some weird probably production stuff that went on probably went over budget all these things so we're, we're seeing it now but um yeah i can can confirm it's better than like a boss and the grudge so it's probably the best 2020 movie of this year uh, so far but yeah it's just it drops you into this into this really bad harrowing situation where kristen stewart's just kind of brushing her teeth and then everything goes to hell and then it's 90 minutes of fun and that's then the movie's over. So um, in my in the ripe old age of 24, I've realized how great a 90 minute movie is. Um, so you're in, you're out, you know exactly what you're getting. Um, there's really, there's a fun, a few fun surprises in there. Um, you can kind of, but that's really it. That's just, it's just a movie about underwater monsters. <laughs> that's, that's all. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited to see it. I'm too bad. It's not doing as, as great as, probably I would have expected. I thought this film was going to do a little bit better. Um, the reviews, I don't think were that great, but uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it seems like it's just, it's just going for fun and I'm, I'm down for that. Yeah. It's definitely a blatant ripoff of like 10 to 15, like other sci-fi movies. <laughs> like, like you said, like, Oh, that's, that's alien. Cool. Like I see, I, I get all this. And I'm like, yeah, like it's, there's nothing original here. Um, and some of the visuals are a little frustrating because it's like, it's down, like, I don't know if it's the Marina's Trench, but it's it's down really deep in the water, like six, seven miles deep. And a lot of the visuals, it's really murky. Like, there's some times where I just didn't understand what was happening. Um, there was, like, one person I thought was dead, and then he showed up alive later. And I was like, oh, you're still alive. Cool. Um, so, yeah, there's just there's a lot of, like, little stuff like that. It's It was definitely, it feels like there was, like, more here. And, like, there was, like, three edit, three editors on this film, weirdly enough. So it feels like they just kind of like found this movie in editing and chopped a bunch of crap out of it and made it like 90 minutes because it feels like there was a lot more stuff here and they tried to do a little more world building, but they ended up just kind of making a movie that just works superficially. So yeah, it's not going to, it's not going to change the world or anything like that, but it's, it's fine. And Kristen Stewart's great. She makes everything better. So you kind of, you just, you know what you're getting in for when you watch the trailer. Yeah, and this movie is actually kind of similar to New Mutants in the fact that it was filmed a few years ago, and then when Disney bought Fox, it kind of got lost in the shuffle for a little while and is releasing now. So they actually filmed this in uh, early 2017, and three years later, we're getting the finished product, or at least a finished product, because uh, I don't think Disney really knew what to do with it uh, right off the bat. But I think overall, it was really entertaining. I think this would be a great Netflix movie just to watch in a few months when it's, you know, you don't really want to pay attention to something, but you want to see mermaids attack people underwater. Um, and that's really what you get. Like, I can't stress enough how pleasing it was to just watch people get attacked for 30, an hour and 30 minutes. Sounds fun. Yeah, and there's some good kills in this movie, too. There's really some fun, really fun, gruesome things that happen in here. So, yeah, it's 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 underwater. <laughs> it's just, you know what you're getting. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so the, with that, uh, we'll move on to uh, one more film that I know you wanted to talk about a little bit, Nick, and that is Les Miserables. Yeah. So not the the famous musical that you would think or whatever, how many ever movies have come out. But um, this this is from Amazon Studios and it's 
probably going to get nominated for Best Foreign Film. It's the f- French submission uh, for Best uh, Foreign Film, or I guess it's called International Film now. But um, it caused a little bit of a kerfuffle because everyone loves Portrait of a Lady on Fire, and as do I. I actually like that movie a little more than this one, but this one in terms of getting the French uh, submission. Um, so I would encourage everyone to see it, though. It's a really good movie, and if I can describe it, it's basically a French uh, training day um, kind of mixed in the title, uh, Les Miserables. It's kind of updating a lot of the like, the societal and cultural unrest that's in that story, kind of blending it into like this cop uh, drama. So it, it follows uh, a newbie on his first day with two kind of crooked cops and... Um, they get into some trouble. They accidentally hurt a kid, and there's a drone involved. So they're trying to track down all of, of the footage so they don't get in trouble. And they run into a lot of interesting um, kind of different corridors of this neighborhood with different people come from different walks of life. Um, and it all comes to head in the end. And it's a really good movie. And I think it has a lot to say. Um, yeah, I won't. I won't dwell on it too much. But I think it's a movie that pe- a lot of people will find something in, and it has a lot of good genre thrills. It's not. I think it's something that's very accessible to a lot of people. I think what Bong Joon-ho said perfectly in his Golden Globes Awards acceptance speech is perfect here. If you can just get across the the one-inch barrier of subtitles, then you're going to have a really good film here. And that's just it. It's just really solid, and you're going to hear about it a lot in the next couple of weeks. So I think it's definitely something to look out for. Love that quote. It's the best, isn't it? Bong, Bong Joon-ho is like my spirit animal. I love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so that is pretty much what's going on at the box office. It's January, so it's pretty slow. Not going to be anything super dramatic here uh, for a while. But we'll be back next week talking about Bad Boys for Life, uh, which I still haven't seen a Bad Boys movie, so I'm sure that'll be an interesting watch. <laughs> as well as Doolittle, which has every famous person in it. Um, so that'll be something <laughs> Uh, But yeah, we'll be here talking about it. 